invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. We're going to be in Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3 this morning. Have a lot of territory to cover, and I think you'll find it helpful if you have your Bible open or pulled up on your favorite smart device or app. A Methodist and a Baptist were arguing with one another about whose tribe is the greatest. And they finally decided to ask for a sign from above. And almost immediately, a letter fell from the heavens. And this is what it said. My sons and daughters, please stop bickering about such trivial matters. Sincerely, Jesus, baptized by John the Baptist. Now, I expect that joke to fall a bit flat here in a church of Christ. Because we're all thinking silly denominations, arguing whose is the greatest. Everyone knows there's only one true church, and we're it. But that little joke is a convenient reminder of Paul's purpose in writing his letter to the church in Rome. He writes Romans not to tell sinners how to get saved. He writes Romans to encourage status-conscious Christians to get along with one another. And one of the ways he does this in the early chapters of Romans is he reminds both Jewish and Gentile Christians what they have in common, especially their common salvation and their allegiance to Christ Jesus the Lord. This is what creates unity in the church, he says over and over again in a variety of ways. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says it this way. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And then he begins to unpack those shared beliefs, those shared convictions, that shared life in Christ. But before he digs into their shared salvation and allegiance, he digs into something else they have in common that's not so positive, not like salvation and allegiance. He digs into their sin. And not just that they're guilty of sin, but that they are under the power of sin. That they are slaves to sin. We jump to the end of his argument at Romans 3, verse 9. You can see where he ends up. We'll, we'll figure out how he gets there in a bit. But this is where he concludes. This is verse 9, chapter 3. What shall we conclude then? For we have already made the charge... That Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. Not just guilty of sin, but under sin's power. It's a force that has enslaved Jews and Gentiles. And then a little bit later in chapter 3, verse 23, he says, There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we've been using this triangle diagram to help make our way through Romans and to understand what he's saying we could say rather than let's go back to that Christ diagram real quick rather than Jews and Gentiles are united in Christ he we can flip it now and he's also saying Jews and Gentiles are united the sin diagram are united in their sin they are both guilty and enslaved to sin now I don't expect that to be a shocking conclusion to anyone in this room that's not groundbreaking material. Romans 3.23, for all of sin and fall short, short of the glory of God, is one of the most recognizable verses, not just in Romans, but in all the Bible. The doctrine or the idea of universal sin is empirically verifiable. We do not have to, on faith, believe that people are sinners. We can see it. We can observe it. We can measure it. We can prove it so this morning i'm not so interested in paul's conclusion that jews and gentiles are like are under the power of sin that seems a bit obvious and self-evident to me what i'm more interested in this morning is how paul makes the case how he frames his argument and how that his logic how it supports his larger purpose of encouraging jewish and gentile christians to love and accept and get along with one another so let's pick up this negative argument beginning in chapter 1, verse 18, where Paul describes Gentile sin from a Jewish perspective. 
He says, beginning of verse 18, the wrath of God, and we'll talk more about that next week, but the wrath or anger of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So we go all the way back to creation. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, birds, animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. I referenced this passage several times last fall in our series on idolatry. So hopefully a lot of what Paul says in this opening paragraph is familiar, or at least is a review for many of us, as we covered so much of this in our Idol Factory series. But if you remember back to that series, Paul makes the claim, or according to Paul we could say that the fundamental sin of humanity, the original sin of humanity, is idolatry. It's the ultimate gateway sin to all other sins. And when humanity worships created things rather than the creator, they are committing the ultimate rebellion, the ultimate sin against God. And when human beings worship created things rather than organizing their lives around the glory of God, Paul says their hearts and their minds are darkened. It brings all kinds of negative consequences into the world. He goes on to say that Paul responds to human idolatry. God punishes human idolatry by handing over human beings to their sinful desires. That's God's punishment. Okay, you want to worship idols? Just go and do whatever you want to do. Have at it. Your will be done. Have it your way. And then he, he goes on to say then, as God hands over idolatrous human beings to their sinful desires, the result is unrestrained sexual immorality. And this is a classic Jewish description of Gentile sin, non-Jewish sin in the world. When ancient Jewish theologians and Bible scholars talked about Gentile sin, they almost always connected idol worship with sexual immorality. They go together. Sexual immorality follows idol worship. And perhaps this is based on Jewish observation of what happens at pagan temples when Gentiles get together to worship their idols and all of the other things that happen in and around those temples. In verse 26 and 27... Paul uses homosexual activity as the ultimate example of idolatry-fueled Gentile sexual immorality. He does not talk about orientation. He does not talk about inclination, but he does talk about activity, behavior, as a result of ancient idol worship. At this point, now that I have all of your attention, some of you are hoping I'll say a bit more. Others are wishing I had already said less. But the truth is, today on this topic, I'm not saying anything at all. I'm following the logic of Paul's argument so that we can understand what he's saying in his letter and how what he's saying fits into his larger point and how that larger point is the real big idea of his message. And I'm content to leave it there for now. 
Because what Paul says about homosexual behavior in these two verses is really a very small part of the much larger description of Gentile sin in Romans chapter 1. If you keep reading, you'll see that Paul doesn't camp out on sexual immorality of any kind. Instead, he goes on to list a host of other sins that are the result of God handing idol-worshiping human beings over to their own desires. And it is quite a list. Let's pick it up in verse 28. It says, Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. And although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, that's quite a list of wrongdoing, isn't it? That's quite a vice list. And it's an extreme description of Gentile wickedness. Not every Gentile in the world is engaging in all of those practices. Paul's not talking about individuals. He's talking about general groups of people. And he's describing them from a Jewish point of view. And this is a stereotypical list where a Jewish teacher would say, do you see how bad they are? And one of the clues to what Paul is doing in this whole section is the way he uses the pronoun they. Did you notice how many times they was there? It's there repeatedly. They, they, they. This is what they do. They, this is how bad their sins are. They. Pro tip for following Paul's train of thought in Romans. Pay attention to the pronouns that show up in different parts of the letter. Sometimes Paul says I. Sometimes he says we. Sometimes he says you. Sometimes he says they. He uses different pronouns to speak to different points of view, different groups in the Roman church. So from a Jewish perspective, he says they about Gentile sin. Their sins are really bad. That's what they do. But watch the turn in chapter 2. He stops using they and adopts another pronoun. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says you not they, we're not talking about them anymore, we're talking about you. You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are being condemned, or you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Who is the you in this passage? Presumably, Paul is addressing an imaginary Jewish judge that he's setting up to be his opponent that he's going to argue back and forth with in chapters 2 and 3. He's using a diatribe style where he's arguing and anticipating responses and arguing and they're going back and forth. And it's this Jewish judge that is standing as a representative of the Jewish Christians in the church in Rome who likely, as Paul was finishing up chapter 1, talking about Gentile sin, they're all thinking, yep, that's right. That's how they are. That's what they do. That's why they are so bad. And then he flips it. And in the famous words of Admiral Akbar, it's a trap. Because he lays on this thick description of Gentile wickedness and unrighteousness to set his Jewish brothers and sisters up for the punchline, which must have felt like a punch to the gut. It's not about what they do, it's about you standing before God's righteous judgment. He goes on in chapter 2, verse 2. 
He says, now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? He says to his Jewish brothers and sisters, we're right, we know the truth. God is a righteous judge who judges unrighteous behavior among the Gentiles. But he also judges unrighteous behavior among the Jews. And God is an impartial judge. He does not play favorites. And if both Jews and Gentiles will stand before the righteous judgment of God, do you really think you're any better off than they are? For Paul says you do the same things. Assuming he's talking about those sins at the very end of Romans chapter 1. He says, you do the same things. You're not better than they are. And the irony, maybe even better, the, hip the hypocrisy of Jewish condemnation of Gentile idol worship and the sexual immorality that flows from it is captured in one of the most famous stories in the Old Testament. It's the story where Israel, camped at the base of Mount Sinai, builds a golden calf and then worships it, and then out of that idol worship there emerges all kinds of revelry, is the language in the story. And they do this just after God has saved them from slavery in Egypt. It's their foundational story as a people, and in the midst of it, they are worshiping an idol. Paul talks about this in one of his, another letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, and he's speaking about the golden calf story. Chapter 10, verse 6, he says, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did, the Israelites. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and then got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. You see, idolatry, sexual immorality, it's there in the story. But here Paul is not talking about Gentiles. He's talking about the Israelites. Who are you to judge, he says, when you do the same things? Not speaking just about individuals, but groups of people. You really think your group of people is a better group than their group? You do the same thing. And then in chapter 2, he goes on, and we don't have time to read every verse, but he goes on to describe how God chose Israel for a special purpose in the world. And that was to be a light to the Gentiles. To share God's truth with those Gentiles who were living in darkness, but the Israelites didn't live up to their calling. They fell into the same traps as the Gentiles did. So we pick it up at the end of chapter 2, verse 17. He says, now, if you call yourself a Jew, and if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, it, these are all the arguments the Jewish judge would make. He said, if you think you're a light for those who are in the dark, a light for the nations, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you have the truth, and you're supposed to share it with everyone else, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? And he goes on to describe how they do not practice what they preach. You who preach against stealing, do you steal? Implied yes. You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Implied yes. You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Yes. You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, then he quotes from an Old Testament prophet, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. God's name is supposed to be glorified among the nations because of you, but instead, God's name is blasphemed because of your hypocrisy. You do not practice what you preach. And so, Paul uses a lot of strong aggressive language in this section. Paul is casting himself as the prosecutor. He's making his case. There's a lot of legal language in Romans 1, 2, and 3 about bringing a charge against all sinners. 
he's making his case that Jews and Gentiles are all in the same boat. They're all enslaved to sin. They're all guilty. And it is sin that equalizes the two groups of people. They're both slaves to sin. And the fundamental sin they commit is not breaking God's moral code. It's by failing to live up to their original job description. Seen those memes on social media? You had one job. You had one job and you couldn't do it. You didn't do it. Paul's essentially saying to both Jews and Gentiles in this section, you had one job. Gentiles, created in the image of God, your one job was to reflect the glory of God into creation as you worshiped God. and You blew it. And to the Jews, he said, you had one job, and that was to reflect God's glory among the nations so that they could be restored to their creator. That was your job, and you blew it. Both of you, Jews and Gentiles, have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. You failed to glorify God. And the weight of this argument does not fall on the Gentile Christians in Rome. It falls on the Jewish Christians in Rome with their religious traditions and heritage and history because they believe they occupy a higher status in the church than Gentile Christians because of their history and their heritage. And Paul is using universal sin to equalize the groups. He does this not to convict them of their sins so they will turn to Christ and be saved. They've already done that. He does this because he's laying a foundation for what he's going to say at the end of his letter in Romans chapter 14 when he's talking about the weak and the strong, these two groups that are at odds with each other in the Roman church. Notice how this same kind of language shows up in Romans 14. Romans chapter 14, verse 4, he asks, Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. And then he goes on in verse 10, You then, why do you judge your brother and sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, It is written. I thought it was written. It is written. As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, Paul says, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. When he says stop passing judgment, he's not saying we should stop having difficult conversations or stop speaking the truth and love to one another. He's not saying you shouldn't confront or challenge someone whose behavior is destructive or disruptive or sinful. It's not a live and let live philosophy. It's not what passing judgment means in Romans. When he says stop passing judgment, he's saying stop elevating yourselves over other people in the church because of who you are or where you came from or how you grew up. For the church in Rome, this means that the Jewish Christians should not look down on the Gentile Christians because of the Gentiles' past sinful lifestyles. They shouldn't look down on the Gentiles because they didn't grow up going to synagogue and learning the law of Moses. But it also means the Gentile Christians shouldn't look down on the Jewish Christians because the Jewish Christians occupy a lower social status in Rome, maybe even social outcasts in Rome. They have less power in their neighborhoods. The Gentiles have more power. Because they're equalized, not only in Christ, but they're equalized in being under the power of sin before Christ. Well, what does this mean for us? Getting Jews and Gentiles, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians to eat at the same table is not the challenge that churches like ours are facing today. So what does this mean to us? Stop passing judgment on one another. It's not just a Jewish-Gentile Christian problem. 
is there are a number of ways that we still can adopt superior attitudes over other human beings, other sinners, other Christians. There are all kinds of stories we can tell ourselves about them to make us feel better. They weren't raised a Christian. They weren't raised going to church. They don't know the names of the 12 apostles or the books in the New Testament. They can't answer basic questions in Bible class. They were raised Baptist. They were raised Methodist. They were raised Catholic. They didn't graduate from college. They don't live in Highland Park. They live in Highland Park. They have a tattoo. They filed bankruptcy last year. They're divorced. They're Democrats. They're gay. And on and on it goes. We tell ourselves a story about them to elevate ourselves and to make us feel better. In his book, Irresistible, Andy Stanley tells a story about working with a counselor who helped him overcome his judgmental attitude toward his father and those who supported his father as his parents were going through a very public, very painful, very messy divorce. Andy Stanley is Charles Stanley's son. Charles Stanley is a famous preacher. Many of you have seen him on TV. And his parents went through this awful divorce. And Andy, of course, was caught in the middle of it. And he blamed his dad. And he, he had judgmental attitudes toward his dad. And it threatened to destroy their relationship. And so he's working with this counselor about his attitude toward his dad. And one day they're having a conversation. And Andy, as he tells the story, says, I was railing against my dad and everyone who supported him. And I was explaining to my counselor that they were wrong and I was right. In fact, I was the only person in the whole situation, in our whole family, that was right about all of it. I was the only one who saw the truth. And his counselor asked him, said, Andy, if you were one of the original disciples, how would you have responded to Peter when he denied the Lord? And Andy says he didn't have to think about it at all. He knew. His immediate response was, he'd be out. Done. Gone. Can't tolerate that kind of betrayal. And the counselor smiled and said, Andy, what did Jesus do? And Andy hemmed and hawed and finally confessed, oh, Jesus put Peter in charge of pretty much the whole enterprise. That's the danger of cultivating and nurturing and tolerating a superior attitude over other human beings, other sinners, other Christians. Because that superior attitude that comes from the story we tell about them emboldens us to exclude or minimize or marginalize those Jesus has forgiven and is using to further his mission in the world. Because what's happening as we're looking down on them, judging and condemning and categorizing and marginalizing, as we're looking down on them, Jesus is moving toward them. Forgiving, restoring, using. When Paul talks about Gentile sin, he uses the pronoun they. They. When he talks about Jewish hypocrisy, he uses the prophetic you. Take a look at the pronoun he uses when describing God's love for sinners. 
It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When it comes to sin, when it comes to failing to live up to the glory of God, when it comes to needing to be rescued from the darkness within us and around us, there is no them, there is no they, there is no you, there is no me, there's only us, there's only we. Because we are all in this together. Yes, because of our sin, because of our failure to live up to the glory of God, but more importantly, because of Christ, who overcomes our sin. And that's where we'll pick it up next week. Let's stand and sing.